Here, here's the title. Remember, remember, remember. That, that's what I want you to get this morning is remember, remember, remember. What, what would life be like if, if we didn't have memory? We have lost memory. What would like, life be like without memory? Think about that. Think about your memory. Because they tell us that memory is the superior cognitive process that defines the temporal dimensions of our mental organization, right? In other words, it, it, it gives us the ability to encode and store and retain, and most importantly, to recall. That's what memory does. Recall what? Our past experiences. It makes sure that, that the, the fundamental roles of our life, the past, reflecting the past accurately, but some of us have some shortcomings in our memory. In our family, it's Katie. She doesn't quite remember things the way she should. But, and make sure that our past experiences stay in, in the continuity between our future and our present day. All that to tell you this, memory is essential to life. What happens if you don't remember your anniversary? Mm. You've never done that, have you? Don't raise your hand. Well, what happens if you don't remember your first date? Has your wife ever done that to you? Do, do you remember our first date? Like, sure I remember. What was I wearing? Has that move ever come out? Or, or do you remember your first kiss? Where you were? Some of you young people shouldn't be shaking your head. No kissing until you're 30. Parents? Amen? I don't know if my children really listen to that rule. Jonathan? Until she's 30, son. Do you remember the first song you ever danced to? Think about this. Think about your memory. You, do you remember the time you fell in love? Right? What year it was? What was going on in your life? How old you were? And I... I and this is not just for people that have lived some life. This is for people, young people too. Do, do you remember things about your life that are good memories? Because memories, memories serve a purpose. And there's, there's the not so good memories. They, they serve a purpose as well too. I know we don't like to think about it, but, but they tell us that we remember more of our negative part of life than we do our happy parts. We remember those things. Researchers like Elizabeth Kingsler, she's out of Boston College, says studies using functional magnetic renaissance imaging, which is fMRI, have shown negative events stimulate activities in, in emotion processing ranges of or regions of our brain, such as the orbital frontal cortex and the amygdala. So this is where we store memory. This is what she says. She says, the more these emotional centers are activated by an event, the more likely an individual is to remember specific details linked to an emotional aspect of the event. Think about this. In other words, this is what she's saying. She's talking about not so good memories, right? I don't want to call them bad memories. It's, it's not so good memories. They're memories that, that we would like to forget. So what she's saying is, in other words, if if I preach a horrible sermon, you're most likely to remember it than if I preach a credible sermon. That, that's, that's not funny? Yeah. <laughs> so I, I'm determined, like, I'm just going to preach bad sermons because you'll remember them better. You, you, you will think back and go, yeah, that's when he didn't do so well, right? That's, that's the conclusion that I got from, from 
the memories that are not so happy. But, but here, listen, memories hurt. Some memories hurt. And they bring pain with them. And, and some memories bring joy and they bring happiness with, with the thoughts. Memories are essential to life. They're, they're, they're essential to life. And throughout scripture, God calls his people to remember. If you read the scriptures, you see everywhere that God wants his children to remember. And, and what is it that he wants them to remember? Well, he, he wants them to remember his goodness. And he wants them to remember his mercy and his faithfulness and, and his mighty power. God calls us to remember. He wants us to remember everything, the good and the bad. He wants us to remember. He wants the children of Israel to remember the bondage in which they lived when they were in Egypt. To never forget that. God, in his, in his command to the children of Israel... It's to remember. And he's very specific. He's very specific about the memories of his children. He, the command to remember. I, I want to read you the scripture for today out of Exodus chapter 13. This is, this is what God told Moses to tell the people. God said, then Moses said to the people, Commem commemorate this day. In other words, it means commemorate means to remember, to recall, to honor, Right? Honor this day. Remember this day. The day you came out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. Because the Lord brought you out with a mighty hand. He says, eat nothing containing yeast. Today is, is the month of, of Aviv. You are leaving when the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The land he swore to your ancestors to give you. A land flowing with milk and honey. You are to observe this ceremony in this month. For seven days, eat bread without yeast. And, seven, and on the seventh day, have a festival. God's cool. You know that? He's like, for seven days, I want you to eat horrible food. Horrible food. It's to remind you. It's so you remember. Remember what? Where we were a year ago. Six months ago, 10 years ago, to remind you, right, I, every year in the month of Aviv, I want you to eat seven days horrible bread, horrible bread, bread without yeast. And then on the seventh day, I want you to throw a party in my honor. I want you, I want you to celebrate, right, I want you to, to remember how I brought you out. And then this is what he says. He continues. He says in verse 7, eat unleavened bread during these seven days. Nothing with yeast in it to be seen among you. Nor shall any yeast be seen anywhere within your borders. Only, excuse me, on that day tell your sons, I do this because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. This observance will be for you like a sign on your hand and a reminder on your forehead that this, that this law of the Lord is to be on your lips. For the Lord brought you out of Egypt with his mighty hand. You must keep this ordinance at the appointed time year after year. You must. Then he tells them, after the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you, as he promised, right, the faithfulness of God, an oath to you and your ancestors. Now, when he says ancestors, what he's talking about is Abraham. That God had promised Abraham that his offspring would, would have the, the promised land. And he says, you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every Womb. All the first males of your livestock belong to the Lord. Redeem them with a the lamb, every firstborn donkey. But if you do not redeem it by break its neck, poor donkey. Redeem your firstborn among your sons. In those days to come when your sons ask you, what does this mean? Say to him, with a mighty hand, the Lord brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. When, when Pharaoh's stubborn 
Lee refused to let us go. The Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animal in Egypt. This is why I sacrifice to the Lord the first offspring. Now, if you're not familiar with this story of Moses, I encourage you to go read it. It's a powerful story. And as you can see from the scripture that I'm reading to you, that God is very concerned about your memory. He's very concerned on how you recall things. He's very intentional about you remembering his faithfulness, his promise fulfilled, his covenant kept. He's very intentional about the children of Israel remembering his mighty hand. He says, remember, commemorate, think about. And it was easier getting Israel out of Egypt than it was getting Egypt out of Israel. So much easier because there was a temptation to go back to the way things were. If you read the story or even if you watch the movie, you, you'll see that the people complained when, when they were leaving Egypt. They always thought if we could just go back to Egypt, if we can just go back to our old life, if we can just go back to the way things used to be. For some reason they thought slavery was more, was, was better than what, where God was taking them currently. Isn't that, isn't that odd? You see, God's concerned about how we remember things. So here, here's the first point. Remember your first love. Remember your first love. And I don't mean your girlfriend. I don't mean your spouse currently. I mean God. The memory that you have when you first gave your heart to God, do you, do you remember that day? I want you to think about this. I want you to see in your mind's eye where you were. I want you to think about your life in that moment. The book of Revelation calls a church to remember. Revelation 2 says this, to the angel of the church of Ephesus write, these are the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks among the seven golden lampstand. That's Jesus that he's referring to. He says, I know your deeds, your hard work and your perseverance. I know that you cannot tolerate wicked people. That you have tested those who claim to be prophets but have not found them to be true. You have persevered and have endured hardship for my name and have not grown weary. This church is incredible. God's praising them for their, their well-doing. He's, he's praising them for their tenacity to hold to truth by calling out the false prophets. Apostles, by calling out the false prophets, by calling out people who are not speaking the truth, their endurance, their hard work, their perseverance to see the kingdom of God flourish. This church was incredible. And as incredible as it was, it almost sounds like they were more mechanical than they were emotional with God because he says, I hold this against you. You have forsaken the love you had at first. And another translation says, says it this way, that you have forsaken your first love. That, so he says, consider how you have fallen. Oh, my goodness. This church was doing all the right things. They were ministering. They were having youth ministry and children's ministry. They were ministering to the community. They, they probably had a, a nice place to meet. And they probably served popcorn in their, in their auditorium. And they probably had coffee for their guests. And they did all these cool things. And their preacher was probably amazing. Like the best preacher in town. Like that, that guy was off the chain. Like, like that's the kind of church they had. But what happens? God says, I have this against you. You're good in deeds, but you don't love me. Is it possible 
Is it possible to be a Christian and not love God? Is it possible to actually do the right things in life and not love God? Is it possible to be a healthy church and not love God? Because it seemed like it was in Ephesus. It seemed like everything was going good. But God, he didn't look, out the, look at the exter- external things of life. He looked at their heart. He said, I'm piercing through your heart and I see that you don't love me. The Lord wants your affection. He wants you to consider. That's what he says. Consider how far you've fallen. I want you to think about it. I want you to remember where you were when you first fell in love with me. I want you to think about the song that made you dance. I want you to think about the, 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 the scripture that made your heart come alive. I want you to think about the moments you had with me that caused you to just crumble into my arms. I want the affection. I want you to remember. That's the same call that he gave to the children of Israel. When you do this, remember the mighty hand of the Lord. That's a phrase to say, remember my faithfulness. Remember my mercy. Remember my strong hand, how I delivered you. God wants the same for us. He wants you to think about it. What's interesting about this verse, if you can put it back on the screen, he says, consider How far you have fallen. There was such a disconnect from their mechanical Christianity to their their relationship Christianity. He says, you've fallen. You're not even in in, in my radar. You're not even in my atmosphere because you don't have love for me. Can you, can you think about where you are now and when you first fell in love with God? Is it the same? Do you have more passion? Do you have less passion? Are you mechanical? Are you just religious? Or do you have a relationship with him? Because it's very different. He wants you to think about it with intention. He wants you to remember how you first loved him. You know, that new love, that, that young love. You know what I'm talking about. That romantic love, the desire, the want, that 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 God wants us to have for him. He wants you to remember. It's what they lost. They were so busy doing good that they lost their love for God. You know how that is. Those of you that have been married for some time, you know how it can be mechanical and routine. They say you got to do things to keep the fire alive. It's no different with God. God wants us to love him with passion. When's the last time you've been passionate for God? If your extent of passion is lifting your hands five more inches, we're in trouble. We are in trouble. If your passion for God is is just showing up to church, we we have forgotten. We've forgotten. Two minutes? Is that, does that mean I have two minutes left? What, what does that mean on the screen? Is that a cue for me? Oh, all right. Don't do that to me. I'm like, dude, if I've been preaching that long, like, I've even lost track of what I'm doing. Okay, there we go. Come on. What's going on back there? Listen, he, he wants us to be passionate people. Passionate people are not mechanical. You you know that, right? Passionate people are not mechanical. Mechanical Christians are are routine in their worship. They're they're very routine in their worship. You you can almost almost pinpoint when their hands are going to go up. You can almost pinpoint when, when something might change in their body language. Listen, listen, passionate Christians are spontaneous. They're spontaneous in their worship. They don't care who's watching. They're going to dance and they're going to shout and they're going to get excited in the presence of the Lord. Spontaneous uh, Christians are adventurous. They're they're risk takers for God. 
Those people that truly love God, they're willing to take risks. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. It's like that girl that you really, really want to date, and you have to step out on a limb because you know she's like 10 grades above you. And you're like, oh, my goodness, I have to step out. I have to be spontaneous. I have to do something adventurous. I have to, I have to get, throw myself out there. Why is it any different for God when you come into his presence? He's watching you worship. He's watching you sing or not sing. He's watching your body language. He's watching how much do you love him. He wants people that are in love with him. He doesn't want mechanical Christians. No. It's, I love this song. It's, it's, like, it's like, like the song says, you know, when, when, when you sing the old hymn or the old song, Come on! Spontaneous worship! Whoa! When you think about the Lord, what does it do to you? Passionate Christians, they're spontaneous. They worship, they shout, they say, God, when I think about your goodness, when I think about your love, when I think about your mercy, when I think about who you are, oh, it makes me want to shout. It makes me want to scream. Oh, church. Worship's not over. We're here for God.
when, when you think about the Lord, when you think about what he's done for you, what does it make you want to do? I, I, I don't know. I, I don't know what it makes you want to do. But, but there's, this, there's this connection with my memory of a 17, 18-year-old kid who, who just needed Jesus. And when I think about where I was and where I am, oh my goodness, when I think about where I could have been, when I think about the things that he has saved me from, when I think about the things he has rescued me from, when I think about the person that I could have been without him, I begin to shout. I'm like, God, I know I'm not perfect, and I know you're still working on me, but oh my goodness, if it wasn't for your blood, if it wasn't for your mercy, I would be dead somewhere. I'd be strung out somewhere. God, who knows what I would be doing, but because you sent your son to save me, to rescue me, oh, you filled me with your Holy Ghost. I just have to shout. I just have to scream. I, I have to thank you, God for all that you've done. Oh my goodness. Oh God, you are so good. God loves spontaneous worship. He wants his people to be passionate. He wants you to do the good things, but he doesn't want you to disconnect with the memory and the love that you have for him and what he's done for you. Come on, if he's done something good for you, give him a shout. Give him a shout. Oh, God. Oh. Woo. So, some of you can't even shout. I, I don't know. I don't know where you are in your heart with Jesus, but, but here, here's how I imagine it. Here's how I imagine it. And we haven't even got to point two. Here's how I imagine it. If someone walked up to me and gave me a check for $100,000 and said, this is yours, I thank you very much. I knew you were on your way because the Lord said so. And he told me that you would write this check for me. So, here's my gratitude. Come on. Come on. Like, if someone gave me a check for $100,000, I'd be like, thank you. Thank you. Christian two-step. How many of you remember the old Christian two-step? 
No, I, anybody remember the old, oh my goodness, no one remembers the old Christian two-step? Uh, you might get me two-step in here, Pastor Greg. I, I, you want to do the old Christian two-step, Pastor Greg? You, <laughs> you, oh, you got it in you, white man. <laughs> look at him, look at him. Oh, come on, come on. <laughs> <Hey>. <laughs> Church is spontaneous because we serve a, a creative God. I mean, when did we become so rigid and so aloof and so stoic in our worship? My goodness, if someone gave you the $100,000 check, think about how much God has given you more than that, what he's done for you. But here, here's the beauty of it, church. Why does God say do that? Well, there are many reasons, but, but here's one of them. So when your children ask you, why are you so fanatic about God? Why do you worship like that? Why do you shout when you go to church? Why are you always crying when you're at the altar? Why, why, why? Let me tell you why, son. Let me tell you why, daughter. Because when I was down and out, God brought me up and over. Oh, come on. He brought me beyond. He set my feet on solid ground. You just don't know what God has done for you. Oh, for me, what has God done for me? You eat at this table because God has blessed us. You drive in that car because God has blessed us. You wear the clothes on your back because God has blessed us. Oh, if you only knew. That's why we do it. We have to remind our children. We have to tell our children why we worship the way we worship, why we shout the way we shout. We have to remember, remember, remember. Ha. Ha. I'm telling you. <laughs> Whoo. I, I can't even get to the second point. I... Uh, 29 minutes. Is that how long I've been preaching? Is that how many minutes I have left? It's, where, where are we at? They're trying to give me signs back there. Move forward. Listen, here's the number two thing. is not only does he want you to remember your first love, remember how you were with him in the beginning. But he, he wants you to remember his deliverance. That story goes from chapter 13 all the way to chapter 14. And if you go home and you take your highlighter and you watch how many times God tells Moses with his mighty hand, it's significant. It's significant. He, he wants his people to remember his deliverance. Remember. Exodus 13, verse 3 says, commemorate this day. Think about it. Honor. Honor me. Because this is the day you come out of Egypt. They've forgotten. They, they forgot how bad slavery was. They forgot how horrible they were treated. They forgot the tough times because it was such a temptation for them. And they prove it over and over in scripture. It was such a temptation to want to go back to Egypt. God says, I need you to remember so you don't return. So you don't go back to slavery. It doesn't matter how tough you think the road is ahead. I want you to remember how bad it was back there. Because, because I'm delivering you. I'm with you. Remember. Remember what I did for you. He says, I, I want you to remember the deliverance. I want you to avoid the corrupting effects of Egypt that that they had on you. So how does he do that? He says, this is the way I want you to do it. I want you to eat unleavened bread. Have no yeast. The yeast in scripture is always a symbolic sign of sin. It was a symbolic sign. There's a few, few passages, and I don't want to get into that, but, but just know that there are just a few passages that, that where yeast does not represent sin, but yeast represents sin in, in most of all of scripture. And when God says, I want you to eat bread without yeast for seven days, and on the seventh day, I want you to, to have this festival, this celebration, he's, he's now prepping for the coming of the Son of, of, of God, right? Because what happens in the New Testament? The New Testament, we see that God... He, he, is, he sends his son and Jesus says what? He says, I am the bread of life without sin. 
Right? There's that, there's that correlation between the Old Testament teaching of no yeast for seven days in the month of Aviv. And, and, and that on the seventh day you celebrate. It's preparation for Jesus coming. He's like, he's the bread of life. He, he's the one that delivers us from all sin and bondage of sin. It's a remembrance, right? This is what Paul says to the church of Ephesus. He says, as for you. This is now in the New Testament. You were dead in your transgressions and sin. In other words, your behaviors were not good. In which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air. The spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. In other words, do you remember Egypt? You remember how bad it was? God is telling us through Paul now, listen, your old way of living, you thought it was good. You thought it was fun. You thought it was nice. You thought all that was, was okay. But he says, he says, all of us who lived among them at one time gratified the cravings of our flesh and followings, following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature deserving wrath. He, he, he immediately tells us that there's no one, there's no one that hasn't gone through that type of, of experience. What experience am I talking about? The transgressions and sin, the disobedience to God. There's no one. He includes himself. He says, all of us. He says, but because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you've been saved. It's by grace that you and I have been saved and God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus in order that the coming age he might show his incomparable riches of grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not for ourselves, it is the gift of God. Not by works so that no one can boast, for we are God's work handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. My goodness. And he continues in the same letter to the church of Ephesus. He says, so I tell you this, and insist on it, that you must no longer live as the Gentiles do in the futility of their thinking. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Having lost all sensitivity, they've given themselves over to sensuality as to indulge in every kind of impurity and they are full of They are full of, they are full of, uh, not everybody's doing it. I won't move on. They are full of greed. greed. That's important. Because greed is not, it's not just referencing money. If you're stuck on money, you got issues with money, where the root of all evil comes from. If you understand the bigger picture of what Paul's saying here, they are full of greed. In other words, they're never satisfied with what they have. You want more. So it drives you to work 80 hours a week. You want more. So you're never satisfied with the house that you have. You're never satisfied with what you are currently blessed with. You want, they're full of greed. That's, that's not the sermon. Let me stop there. Listen, verse 20. That, however, it is not the way of life you learned. When you heard about Christ and were, and were taught in him in accordance with the truth that is in Jesus. We were taught with regard to our former way of life to put off the old self which is being corrupted by deceitful desires to be made new in the attitude of your minds and to put on a new self created to be like God and true righteousness and holiness. Leave it up there. Created to be like who? You're created to be like who? When God created Adam, he created it in what? His image. We were created to be like God. But sin, sin interrupt God's creation and his plan for us. And so what does God do to restore, recalibrate man? He sends his son to redeem us. 
to reconcile us back to God. And so when you are born again, when you give your heart to Jesus, listen to what needs to change. The fertility of your thinking. The way you think needs to change, right? They've lost all sensitivity. Now you're more sensitive to the Holy Spirit and what he has for you because your heart is not hardened anymore. It's gravitating towards the things of God. You have, they have given themselves over to sensuality. So now you're putting into check the desires and the lust of your life. They are full of greed. You're now more generous with what God has blessed you with. All are quiet. So we're taught to put off the old self. Why? Because we've been delivered. We've been set free from the bondage of sin. Put off your old self. Be made new. New in what? Your attitude. High five your neighbor and say, you got a bad attitude. <laughs> you, you got a bad attitude. But Jesus says, through Paul, your attitude needs to be new. Needs to be new. The thinking of your attitude. You, you know how, you know how I know, here, here's, here's, let me just give you a quick, a quick rundown on communication. Communication starts with body language. Can, can I tell you that? Communication starts with body language. So when, when we have horrible body language in presenting ourselves to people, we, we are telling them, I don't, I don't care about what you're saying or you're stealing my time. Right? It's, it's the thinking that needs to change. So, so let's practice. Can we practice body language? They tell us 85% of communication is body language. How many of you would disagree with that? Of course you would. So let's practice. Turn to your neighbor, turn to him, and smile. Smile. Just smile. Just show those, those pearly whites. Just smile. Just, come on. I know it's hard for some of you because you don't realize that when you don't smile, you tell people you have a bad attitude. They're like, are you mad? No, I'm not mad. I'm not mad. I'm really not mad. Like, don't you dare take a picture of that. Where, where's those pictures? I, they'll put up crazy stuff of me on the Internet. Listen, like, Smile. Let people know that, that, that you have a good attitude. Right? If we're going to talk like John Maxwell, that attitude determines your altitude. Right? The level that you're going to soar determines on your attitude. I mean, and, and the Bible is telling us right here that our attitude needs to be corrected. Some of us, we have a bad attitude about life. And I'm here to tell you, remember what God has done for you. Why? Because you're created by God <laughs> to be righteous and true. Here's, here's, here's the final point. Oh, my goodness. I got plenty of time. Here's, here's the final point is that you have to remember your first love. Remember your deliverance. And here's, here's the final thing. Is remember the cost of freedom. Remember the cost of freedom. Just because you didn't pay for it doesn't mean it was free. I, I, I mean, I, I, I can't, I was going to use the word hate. I might as well, I already said it. I, I, I hate when, when, when Christians go around and say, oh, salvation's free. It's a free gift from God. It, it upsets me because it tells me the ignorance that person has that Christ paid on the cross for our sin. Salvation's not free. Just because you didn't pay for it doesn't mean it was free. 
Christ paid for it with every ounce of his blood. He paid for it with his complete obedience to the, the will of the Father. He paid for it with every, every rejection that he received, every moment of being ostracized for doing good. He paid for it. He paid for it when, when the society in which he lived in did not want to accept his goodness. He paid for it. Salvation is not free. Listen, freedom is not free just because you didn't pay for it. it it's, it's free because someone ended up. It's free because someone stepped up to the plate and said, I'm going to do this for you, Father. It's free because of that. Verse 11 in Exodus 13, after the Lord brings you into the land of the Canaanites and gives it to you as he has promised an oath to you and, the, and your ancestors, you're to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. You're to give it over. Why? Verse 15, when Pharaoh stubbornly refused to let us go, the Lord killed the firstborn of both people and animals in Egypt. This is why I sacrificed to the Lord the first male offspring of every womb and redeem each of my firstborn. This is, this is very critical. This is not the first time we see where sacrifice is offered and it's a foreshadowing of Jesus Christ. But it's very deliberate here. It's very deliberate, the, the command that they're supposed to live by, that when, when they come into the land, every year, they're supposed to do this every year, one time a year, they're supposed to offer, they're supposed to offer a lamb on behalf of all their firstborns, whether it's a firstborn livestock or firstborn of, of, of man. <clears throat> Why? Well, in a nutshell, when Pharaoh, after the last plague, he, he refused to turn over the people of Israel. He refused to let them go from slavery. And so, and so God says, I'm going to bring the death angel and I'm going to kill the firstborn of, every, of everyone. Man and creature, going to kill the firstborn. He says, but this is what's going to save you, Israel, because that included Israel. It included the children of Israel. But this is how the children of Israel were saved. They were to sacrifice a lamb. Right? They were to sacrifice a lamb. And they were to take the blood of that lamb and they were to put it on the doorpost of their home. And that, that doorpost had the blood which was a sign for the death angel to bypass that home. And as, you, as I'm telling you that story, you can see how now in the New Testament, Christ becomes the lamb that covers the doorpost of your heart, right? It's a metaphor. It's, it's figurative language so that we understand the, the effects that Christ, the blood that Christ has on our life and, our, and the sin in our life. That the death angel was going to come and there was, no, there was no person that was saved from the death angel, whether they were a Jew or they were an Egyptian. They were both going to die. And the only thing that was going to save them was the blood of the lamb. That was the only thing that was going to save them. And every Egyptian that was in the house of a Hebrew, they were saved because of the blood of the lamb. The blood covers Jews and Gentiles, right? That's what Paul says, that the, that the gospel is salvation unto what? The Jews first and then the Gentiles. And God demonstrates that in the Old Testament. That's how great his mercy is, that he makes way for every person that would ever be born into this earth, that the blood of Jesus, it covers the doorposts of your heart. Why is that so important for us? Why is that important for us to remember that... That we're to remember that freedom is not free. Well, because there's going to come a day when, when the heavens are going to split open and Jesus is going to come back. And he's going to come back for every person that has the blood posted on the doorpost of their heart. If you do not have the blood of Jesus posted on the doorpost of your heart, then you are going to face the judgment of God. Because then at that moment, it is too late. You have made your choice in life. You have decided to reject God and his love 
love. You have decided to reject his mercy. You have decided to reject everything that he has offered to you by way of his son. And because of that, when Jesus splits the sky open, you better be ready because that's the moment when judgment's going to come. He's riding on a white horse and he shall pull his sword and he shall make war against this world. And if the blood is not on your heart, and if it's not a sign that says that you are part of his kingdom, that you've been bought with a price, if it's not there, then you, my friend, have not been redeemed. You have not been reconciled. You have not experienced the born again experience. And I'm here to tell you that all that can change today, that you can put the blood of Jesus on the doorpost of your heart. All you have to do is believe that God so loved the world that he sent his only begotten son that whoever should believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. That you believe that he's, his blood washed your sins away and that God raised him from the dead, from the death on third day. That's what you have to believe. And you will be saved. But it's up to you. That's the beauty of God. He gives you free will. He gives you free choice. You can decide. If I reject God, does that mean my life is going to be miserable? That I'm going to, I'm going to have all this heartache? No, no, not at all. The Bible says it rains on the just and the unjust. That means that life will be what you make of it because God has given you that ability. You were created in the image of God. But if you do not have the blood of Jesus Christ on the doorpost of your heart, now we're talking about an eternal thing. We're talking about you going to heaven and spending eternity with God. And there's a lot of people, I'm telling you, I, when I witness the people, there's a lot of people that truly believe that God is not going to send them to hell. That God is not going to judge them. Why would a loving God do such a thing? It's like, he made provision for you and me. It's just, do you accept it? Do you want it? No one's going to force you. Because if Jesus lives in your heart, everything changes. Everything changes. Your attitude your passion. Listen, it's, freedom's not free. The, it's, I think it's very appropriate for us in, in today's, <laughs> or in, in, in Texas, is that I recalled the Battle of the Alamo. You know, they, the, the famous phrase, you know the famous phrase, right? On three, say it. One, two, three. Remember the Alamo, right? It was a phrase that was created when Mexico invaded and they took over the little mission in San Antonio, right? But it was later used in, a, in, in the Mexican War. <clears throat> war. I don't know where that came from. <laughs> the war. <clears throat> it was later used in the Mexican War. What, what were they shouting? Remember the Alamo. Well, why were they shouting it? Because it, it became a phrase of, it became a, a battle cry for, for that we will never be overtaken again. That we will always be prepared. We will always be ready for the enemy. We'll always be ready for an attack. We'll always be on guard. That's what the blood of Jesus does for your life. It will always, you, it will always be ready for when he returns. That your life will be marked as his that you will never have to face a battle alone, that you'll never have to face a situation without the Holy Spirit, that you'll never have to be without wisdom because wisdom from heaven is, 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 is better than earthly wisdom. You will never be without. Why? Because of what Jesus did for you. It's to remember the Alamo. But I'm telling you today, remember, remember, remember. Remember what God has done for you. This is what First Peter says. He himself bore our sins. 
speaking of Jesus, in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed for you were like sheep going astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and overseers of your soul. Come on, church. He bore it for us. First John says, but if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. Right? Isaiah 53 says, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him. And by his wounds we are healed. We are all like sheep gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Freedom is not free. Jesus paid it for you and me, and he did it once and for all so that we can be, as the song said, brave, so that we can be courageous, so that we can do his will on this earth, so that we can be the laborers that go and bring in the harvest, so that we can do what God wants us to do as a church. Yes, he paid it. Freedom is not free. So in closing, we're done. We're done. Here, here, here's what I want you to do. I want you to remember your first love. I, I want you to remember your deliverance, where you were when God saved you, where you were when he turned your life around. I want you to remember that freedom is not free. In America or anywhere across the world, someone is laying down their life for the freedom. You know, America is not the only free country in the world. I know we, we get so narrow-minded, we think that we're America the Great is the only free country in the world. Listen, there are other countries, there are a hundred other countries, sovereign countries that are free. People had to pay for that freedom. How many of you know that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever? Do you believe that? Raise your hand. Raise your hand if you believe that God is the same yesterday and today forever. Listen, in the Old Testament, God says, I want you to have a week where there's unleavened bread. Yeast can't even be anywhere in the campsite. Can't be anywhere seen. It, nowhere. And in our minds, we're probably thinking of a, of, a, of a little congregation. Listen, there are millions of people in the children of Israel when they come out of Egypt. And God says, in the in, in the nation, there should be no yeast anywhere. I don't know what they go do with it. They grab, grab all the yeast and they throw it in the river. I don't know, but it should not be there. I do know. I'm just being facetious with you, right? So, but I don't know why I said that. Here, here, here's what you need to know is that God does that and he says, remember. Commemorate, right? He wants you to remember. He wants you to think about it. What does he do in the New Testament? Because he's the same yesterday, today, today, and forever. He's always about signs. He's always about us gravitating to, to what he's done for us. Because the Bible is about the story of Jesus. It's not about us. It's what Jesus has done for us. It's what the gospel does to us. It transforms us. So every one of you that thought of the communion, you get an A for, just, for today. Do you remember... The night that Jesus was betrayed, he took the bread and he said, whenever you do this, do this in what? Remembrance. And then he took the cup and he said, whenever you do this, do this in what? Remembrance. What is Jesus wanting them to remember? The price he paid. It was loaded. I mean, it was loaded because he's talking to Jews in the upper room. He, he's talking to them. He's like, I want you to remember the promise that God made with Abraham. I want you to remember how he put a goat in, in, in the bush so that Isaac would be saved. I want you to remember how he took care of Ishmael and, 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 and Isaac. I want you to remember how God had destroyed the earth with a deluge, but his mercy saved seven people. I want you to remember how God has taken the children of Israel from test to battle, from test to battle, and how he's delivered them in spite of their adulterous ways, in spite of their stubbornness, in spite of their rebellion, in spite of how they turned their back on them. I want you to remember when Jesus says, remember this, he's telling them, I want you to remember your lineage. I want you to remember the history stories. I want you to remember what God has done. So every time 
we take the communion, I want you to remember the price that, that Christ paid on the cross for you. Where we're to remember, we're to think about, we're to know. Because if we remember, and we remember well, how do we do that? Through his word. you live life without remembering what he's done for you, we're, we're no different from the children of Israel. We want to go back to who we used to be. We want to go back to what we used to do. 